I am Lee Humphreys. I am the director of Query, the Qualitative and Interpretive Research Institute. Um, thank you for joining us today. Um, so before we get started, I just wanted to let people know that um, in addition to workshops that will be continuing next semester, um, I wanted to uh, thank everyone who came to the happy hour that we held um, the week before Thanksgiving. It was really fun just to have some uh, more, uh, I don't know, casual conversations about methods and research. And um, Erica Abbott and I have been uh, planning the program for next semester, and we are taking a lot of the ideas that came from that happy hour. So thank you um, to those of you who were able to attend. Um, the next thing that I just wanted to mention is that Query is going to start or is just starting um, what we call our sort of featured query researcher. So part of the job of Query is to promote the really outstanding research that is already going on at Cornell. Um, and so what we're doing is we're going to um, have a, a researcher of the month kind of thing. And so we have uh, just launched that um, this, this week and our featured researcher uh, is Sofia Villanis uh, in the Department of Anthropology. Um, and so we have, um, it's probably because I have small children, um, we've decided to make a query Mad Lib for all of our um, featured researchers where we give them the main sentence and then they have to fill it in. So um, I'm putting into chat uh, the, the website where you can check out um, the, uh, the, our most recent researcher. Um, but uh, this is also just a heads up that we might be contacting you um, to be a featured researcher, we're looking to feature both uh, faculty, postdocs, and graduate students who are doing qualitative work. So um, if you do get an email from Erica, uh, and um, just keep just the, uh, I, hope, I hope you'll respond positively. Um, so uh, with no further ado, I wanted to introduce our speakers today. So um, this research is, or this seminar is about qualitative data repository um, and uh, Cornell's relationship uh, with um, Syracuse University on this. So our two presenters today are Linda Kellum and Sebastian, Car Sebastian Karcher. Linda is the senior data li librarian at the at Sizer Cornell Institute for Social and Economic Research, which is a partner of the um, Cornell Center for Social Sciences, uh, in which Query is also based. And Linda supports researchers in data management workflows, data curation, social science, and historical data discovery. Sebastian is the Associate Director of the Qualitative Data Repository at Syracuse University. Um, his main interests are in qualitative data management, data curation, and the integration of technology into scholarly workflows. So um, with no further ado, I will turn things over to Linda. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Thank you um, very much, uh, Lee, for inviting us and um, also uh, for everyone coming today. Um, it, it, we're really glad to be here. I'm going to do a uh, very good an outline up here, do a quick discussion of what Sizer does um, and how we can support qualitative research. Um, I recognize a few of you, so you may have seen some of these things before, but that's okay. It's a reminder. Uh, and then I'll talk about Cornell's QDR membership and what that a little bit about what that involves, and then hand it over to Sebastian to talk more about uh, qualitative data repository. And if you have questions, you're welcome to put in the chat, although I think um, we might hold questions to the end because we'll do big question, discussions uh, session at the end. But I'll also keep during uh, Sebastian's presentation and discussion, I'll keep track of the chats that are coming in. So um, remind us to look back at those. Um, and so, yeah, hopefully you'll have lots of questions and we'll be able to answer them. And I do have, I want to acknowledge there are a couple of team members from Sizer here. Um, Floria, who does um, a lot of the work with the qualitative data researchers um, is here, so he can also provide some insight on that work um, from the Sizer side. Um, so 
Sizer is the Cornell Institute for Social and Economic Research, and I think traditionally has been associated with quantitative research or quantitative data, um, but we do a lot of support. We do try to provide a lot of support for qualitative researchers at Sizer. Um, and a lot of us are qualitative researchers actually. So um, I'm a, a history a doctoral candidate in history. Um, and so I, I work on by nature a qualitative researcher. Um, uh, I do data as well though, because I'm a data librarian and I was a political science master students who have a, a sit on the threshold between the two fields and, and love them both equally. Um, so uh, we also have people who like Florio who has a, a sociology background, does qualitative research in sociology. Um, so there's a wide array of, of qualitative support within Sizer. Um, so in terms of my support, I am a librarian. So I primarily uh, help, re help researchers find access and use data resources. Uh, and again, traditionally that it may be um, with quantitative data, but it doesn't have to be. Um, and I'm open and happy to help anyone if you're looking for qualitative data. Um, there's QDR, but there are also other places that we might look. Um, and so I provide chat and Zoom office hours and can sit down out, either at these times or outside of these times to talk to you with, about your research um, if you are looking for secondary data um, of some sort. But if you are, and if you are collecting your own data, um, we can also help with that. We have a data archive as well. Um, so if you do want to keep your, um, if you have a smaller data set and you want to keep it closer to home, we can talk to you about that. Um, or we can also talk with QDR because we have that, they have, we definitely want to tap into their expertise because they have a lot of it. Um, and we are excited to be a part of that partnership now. Um, so feel free to get in touch um, if you have questions about finding data or, um, if you're starting to collect your own data and working on that, we also have lots of ways to support you. Uh, first off is we have software support. So we do provide access to Atlas TI and NVivo, which are two um, qualitative data uh, analysis software, um, two forms of that. Uh, and Florio does the training for both of these. Um, and these are access to these are available through computing accounts. Um, so if you want to go in, to, you have to create a, a Sizer computing account and then you can go and use Atlas DI and then Vivo through that. Um, some of us have experience, I have experience with Deduce, so that if you're using that separate from what we have, um, we might be able to advise you on using other types of software. And, uh, and as a librarian, I have, um, there are other tools that you might be interested in. I've heard uh, Lee Talks has said that she uses Scrivener, um, which I've used a lot, or Palladio is another one that's sometimes popular with qualitative researchers, um, which is an online resource. So there's a wide variety of tools out there that you might be interested in. Uh, and if you hear of one, I, I get this question a lot, people will hear of a software and they will come to me asking me if I've ever heard of it. And I'll try to find somebody who has used it before and then give them advice. Um, so I'm happy to do that with, uh, if you come across something um, and wanna know more about it. We do one-on-one -on -one consultations and workshops on Atlas TI and then Vivo. Um, the workshops will start, they usually start up pretty early in the, in the spring semester. Um, so keep an eye out for that. And I'll, we'll send a message out through the query network. Um, but you are, if, even if you're uh, experienced using Atlas TI, um, we are happy to do one-on-one -on -one consultations to help you with particular problems that you may, may be running into, or if you're wondering if they can do a, a particular technique, um, we can help troubleshoot whether it works or uh, there might be some other software out there that would work better. Um, Florio and Jacob, um, Florio can talk more about this during the discussion, does consultations on team workflow management. So it, with qualitative research, so if you're starting up a team and you have questions about the workflow for gathering data, um, they can advise you on that. And then Florio also does the consultations on reproducibility pre best practices for qualitative research, which um, Sebastian will address a bit more today. I think I'll touch on that in terms of sharing and what you need to do in order to make sure you have, or have the ability to share your research. Um, in addition, we have secure data services at Sizer, which allows its access to secure servers um, for restricted data through what some of us, call, some of us like to call it CRADC. I like to call it Cradic, just because it's more fun to say. But um, Cradic is a great place where you can, uh, um, if you have restricted data or you're creating restricted data where you have PII and you you need to have some kind of restriction around it, um, Cradic is there for you to do that, and we're happy to work with any um, researchers to figure out if if we are the solution for you. 
And then finally, we do have the ability to do some custom support. Um, we have provided support, um, grant funded custom support for qualitative research projects. And the most famous of this or most well known is Freedom on the Move, which is a database of um, runaway ad or ads for runaway enslaved peoples. Um, and this is something that we built based on grant funding. It's been funded generously by various uh, NEH and uh, Mellon and other funders. Um, so this is something that we have the ability to do, but we, you would need to come and talk to us and we could figure out whether or not um, this would work out. It would definitely need to be a, a grant funded project. <laughs> um, we can't just take on grant uh, projects without having kind of the, the monetary support, but we are happy to talk through ideas um, for these kinds of things. And I encourage you to take a look at Freedom on the Move. It's a wonderful um, resource. And then the, the final thing that I'll talk about is that we, Sizer provides access to other institutions. We provide the institutional memberships for other data archives. So we are a data archive, um, but then we also um, provide access to ICPSR, which is the largest quantitative, with some qualitative um, data archive, social science data archive. Roper Center, which is based at Cornell, but it's a it's a fee membership, so we provide that membership. And then the most recent, which we're really excited about, is QDR, um, we uh, which provides curation and archive services for qualitative data. QDR, we were able to join in July, so we started up in July. Um, unfortunately, right in the middle of the pandemic, so it's been. Uh, <laughs> an interesting um, time to join something. But uh, we are really excited about the relationship that we have with QDR and we want our, our researchers to use this service. Um, Corn uh, Sebastian can talk more about this, but for 2020-2021 academic year, um, the institutional member fee membership fees cover um, curation and preservation of all data projects that are de deposited at QDR. So we have, an, 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 we can talk more about the workflow and whether or not people are at that point that they actually could do this. Um, but QDR can provide an incredible number of services for us um, to help get our uh, qualitative data ready for archiving and sharing into the future. So on that, I'm gonna hand it over to Sebastian. Thank you. And thank you, Linda. And uh, thanks uh, for having me. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about QDR, but I want to focus about what uh, sharing qualitative data looks like and what it entails, then circle back to QDR, also address some of common concerns that we frequently uh, hear and that many of you, I'm sure, have been thinking about since you signed up for this, uh, for this webinar, uh, and then hopefully have lots of time for conversation and uh, discussion. So QDR, uh, we are not just a relatively recently part of Sizer's portfolio of supported data repositories. We're also a relatively young data repository uh, founded in 2000, or it's online uh, since 2014, founded a little bit earlier. Uh, we're currently uh, mainly NSF funded, some other uh, smaller grants. Um, and then uh, we also get increasing amount of funding from individual deposit fees and institutional membership. Uh, ship fees such as uh, Cornell's. Uh, our headquarters, so to speak, are at Syracuse. We have people at uh, Georgetown and at the iSchool at the University of Washington. Um, the origins of QDR are in political science. Those of you who are in political science and neighboring disciplines may know that there is a large international summer institute for qualitative methods at Syracuse University headed by Colin Elman, who is also QDR's director. And kind of out of that broader sphere emerged the uh, concern with how, how can we help qualitative researchers share their data because really all the infrastructure that exists, which is amazing, but it's really targeted at quantitative uh, researchers. Um, this uh, took some time to you know, get, uh, get going. And so initially growth was quite slow. Now it's going much, uh, much faster. We're adding typically about two or three data projects per month, uh, currently at uh, 93. And uh, as Linda pointed out, Cornell is an institutional member. So here are some examples of data that we have, and I'll look at some others in more detail in a minute. Uh, so at the bottom left, uh, this is uh, a 
photograph or scan from archival data. It's actually JFK's diary when he was still a congressman uh, from a project investigating foreign policy views of, uh, of different US presidents. Then in the middle, you see what's probably our um, our bread and butter. This is a de-identified transcript from a focus uh, from a focus group. Yes, uh, <clears throat> discussion. Uh, this one uh, from a project on uh, on maternal health and traditional birth attendance in Nigeria. Um, then perhaps slightly less the more unusual at the top right, this is a screenshot from a presidential campaign video in uh, uh, 1994, I believe, uh, Peru presidential campaign. Uh, so that's Alberto Fujimori. And we have a collection of campaign videos from Brazil and, and Peru. That's from a researcher who studied presidential campaigning uh, in Latin America. And then below that, we have actually a fair amount of that. It's uh, a table from I call that gray literature, broadly speaking. So that's a report uh, from a Mexican municipality on uh, water service uh, provisions. Um, so to give you some other examples and look at them more closely. So this is kind of, I've, I put these together as kind of a collage. On the left here, you see uh, the structure of the project a little bit as it appears on QDR. Um, this is a project on uh, seed uh, ecology and uh, francophone, always get confused, Eastern Africa. Um, and so you see, again, a uh, uh, transcript of, a, uh, of an interview there. It's In this case, it's translated. That's not required. We also take transcripts in any language. We get them. We have, I think, eight or nine different languages currently, including Bangla and one other Indian language. Uh, so can be um, uh, quite uh, uh, varied. Uh, there is cool documentation stuff. So these are focus group uh, maps. Uh, and then there is also, and we do take uh, quantitative components uh, of mixed method data. So these are basic uh, characteristics, rainfall characteristics of, of and associated with the farmers that Crystal Jones, the, the researcher here, uh, talked to. Completely different project. This is uh, Lisa Vidin, a prominent um, ethnographer of, of um, Middle Eastern politics and particularly Syria. So she has this fascinating project talking about uh, the relationship between art and humor and authoritarianism uh, and in, in Syria. And um, she can't for very understandable reason share her interviews and most of her field notes, uh, but she talks a lot about the art and uh, satirical products especially produced and with some additional funding we were able to get a licenses and have translated uh, two of the Syrian um, satirical political satirical TV shows that she talked about and so we are sharing uh, these and they're they're quite fun and and it kind of gives more texture to to the stuff that she's talking about uh, in her book, which came out last year. She also, because she's talking about contemporary politics, um, uses a huge amount of online sources, uh, many of which um, are quite unstable. So you see some like the New York Times, that's not going to go away. Uh, but uh, Arab News, Syria Untold, I think already has gone under. So some of these are quite unstable. And so one of the things that we helped her with would make sure that all of these are um, permanently archived. We use Perma CC, which is a service by, uh, that was started at the Harvard Law Library and is now more widely used. And uh, we have some scripts that, that help us do that very effectively. Um, Again, here's some archival data. This is fun because uh, the data from the archives of the Supreme Court justices has all been uh, dedicated to the public domain. Uh, and so it's very easy to uh, share. Uh, and this is shared uh, as part of a book. And you kind of, kind of see here uh, documents that are specifically referenced in the book but then a huge range of documents that were kind of consulted and are in the backdrop of the book, but not uh, explicitly um, referenced. 
uh, and then also some uh, replication, quantitative replication data that, uh, that Matt hit. Uh, deposited uh, with us. We made sure it runs in Stata, and and so we kind of don't do heavy quantitative curation, but we do make uh, we do uh, do basic uh, curation for uh, those sorts of data. Uh, that's both experimental and survey data. Um, and then uh, finally, um, in one sense, is this a more typical project? So these are interviews. Um, the identified, uh, this is Corey Steinmeier, researcher at University of Maryland, Baltimore. And uh, this is from a sex work uh, court diversion project. So it's quite sensitive, but it's also a number of years old, right? These are eight years old interviews. Um, and she did a lot of work with us on getting these thoroughly de-identified, but they also remain restricted. So you can't just come to QDR, create an account and download uh, them, but the restrictions are relatively light. So it's uh, reasonably easy to get a hold of uh, those. And in addition to these, she also provided a large amount of documentation, which is something that we always emphasize. So the different interview guides for her semi-structured interviews. She did focus groups, the guides for that, a lot of description of uh, participant selection, also kind of the types of assurances of confidentiality, those sorts of things. So just kind of to give you a broad overview of different types of things that you can find on QDR. Um, so by now, you know, you, you're thinking, I, I, I want one of these. So how do you get your data into QDR? Um, and we try to make this really quite simple. Uh, Typically, we like to have an initial consultation, and uh, that can happen any time. Um, and that's typically either with me or with uh, Desi Kirilova, who is the other senior curator at uh, QDR. And um, this actually works best if uh, we do this quite early. So whenever possible, we try to have these conversations uh, before you uh, collect any data. Uh, when you apply for a grant, that's a great moment uh, to have these conversations because you typically now have to write a data management plan anyway. Um, and um, in some cases, we've had these four or five years before we see any of the data, and that's great. And we can, you know, update somewhere intermittently. Um, then when you're ready to start depositing your data and the way QDR is set up, you can do that at your own pace. You uh, can, you know, take six months to get your data up, or you can do everything in bulk. Most researchers like to you know, organize everything themselves and upload it. For us, it really doesn't matter. Uh, it's there waiting for you if you want to circle back to it. Um, <clears throat> and then sometimes we have another conversation if we have specific, particular questions right off the bat. Um, or we then start uh, with the curation process, which includes a disclosure risk review when you have uh, human participants data. So while you're responsible for the de-identification, and I'll talk a little bit more about why that is in a bit, um, we will check that we don't have any particular concerns about it. We think through how might the data uh, be organized and uh, that's often a consultative process. So we make suggestions and you maybe have ideas and then we can kind of go back and forth. The idea is that they reflect your work, right? We, we can really just suggest. Um, we uh, suggest uh, file naming, uh, those types of things uh, where we have concerns about file formats used, we suggest uh, transformations and we typically are able to do those um, with, with few exceptions. Um, there's one other important thing that I'm uh, forgetting. Uh, that's probably uh, uh, probably the, the main, oh, right, documentation. Uh, we look at the documentation you provide and then we suggest other things that we think would be really helpful for researchers uh, coming to see your data to understand what's actually going in on. <clears throat> Once we're done, um, we send this back to you, you take a final look, anything that you have concerns with, uh, we fix, uh, and then we publish and promote it uh, again when you want to. So for example, if you want this to coincide with an article or a book publication, uh, you just let us know. And uh, once we have everything in place, we can publish within hours after you let us know that you're ready for that. Uh, so as I said in the beginning, uh, sharing qualitative data is fairly new. Uh, it's also not uncontroversial. It's particularly controversial in political science. In other disciplines, there's less controversy around it, although it's not necessarily more common there. Um, 
one thing that I, I want to kind of flag at the beginning, and that also goes to the importance of, um, of thinking ahead, um, talking to your participants about data sharing is really important uh, in our view. And we actually look at every single consent script of data deposited with us, and we have sent people away, so to speak, uh, when we found that they've clearly promised that they won't share their data. Uh, with everyone. This is a uh, consent that two researchers at the Guttmacher Institute have used for quite sensitive data. I like to use that because they do interviews about uh, abortion histories um, and so, so quite sensitive. And what they found is even when you give people the direct question, is it okay if we share the de-identified data or not? Uh, I think they had 43 out of 46 people opting in. Um, it's often a misconception that people think uh, participants are going to be super unlikely. But this also means there are people who do not uh, want their data shared and having these opt-in or tiered consent scripts um, is often a nice way to assure that you also hear those voices without uh, sacrificing uh, data sharing. Uh, the Cornell IRB has been at the forefront of IRBs who is aware of data sharing. Um, discussions. I think Florio actually worked with them uh, on some of this. So you have, compared to some of your colleagues, colleagues at other institutions, you have it comparatively easy and you'll find a very sophisticated understanding, I would uh, say, from our conversations with them at, at your IRB uh, running with uh, these types of, of protocol parts. Typically, not always, we did, there can be on the record interviews. We have some interviews with elite politicians, for example, that are on the record. But um, typically, we assure confidentiality in, uh, when we talk about data sharing. And um, there's a number of ways of doing this. Uh, I like to show this because it highlights the importance of uh, contextual knowledge for de-identification, which is why we asked you to do this. So for example, this is in Spanish. So to start with, it's hard to do this. If you don't speak Spanish, you also kind of need to understand what some of the things actually refer to. Uh, so, so you have an acronym like CONABIP down, uh, down here. You need to know what this refers to. Is this a disclosure risk? In this case, it's just a national association of libraries. So obviously when you talk about libraries, that's not a disclosure risk, but, but um, some other examples are um, we had researchers who talked about specific locations like a mall, those types of things. If we're talking about, you know, Destiny Mall, that's that's probably not a disclosure risk. If we're talking about a small strip mall with three stores, uh, it might be those sorts of things. So contextual knowledge is really important uh, to do this properly. It's also the case that qualitative de-identification is kind of somewhere between art and science. And the more you take out uh, the more de-identified the data are, but the more useless the data become, right? And so it's kind of a dance that also should somewhat be informed at by your view of the data of what's most important and most interesting and what perhaps can be um, de-identified with, with less uh, loss of, of significant details. Um, not all data needs to be in the public. I showed the example earlier. That's actually the access condition from that particular uh, project. We can apply access restrictions at the file level. So if you have a project where some of the stuff is um, easy to share, but some is quite sensitive, we don't have to you know, lock the entire project away. And it is the case that restricted data gets accessed much less for obvious reasons, takes more steps. Um, so typical examples would be something simple as the above, right? We just check the person requesting the data is a real researcher. We can verify their identity. Um, often people ask that they have some institutional affiliation, which puts them kind of in the regulatory context uh, of, of institutional oversight uh, and provide a brief research plan. Um, in particular for data where uh, that still contains uh, PII, personally identifiable information, uh, we can require that they themselves pass the IRB and it probably actually would be required that they do if there's PII in the uh, data. It can also often make sense to impose a temple embargo on data. Uh, some people just do that 
short embargoes to uh, be able to publish um, on the data first. So then we took typically talking, you know, a year, max three years. Uh, but in some cases, that's actually a protection for human participants, say, while they're holding a position or in office, those sorts of things. One thing that quantitative researchers typically don't have to fight with and qualitative researchers thinking about sharing their data have to think about a lot is copyrights and licenses. Just as a reminder that almost everything that you see that's published since 1930 is under copyright, even if you, you know, can freely access it, like if you download it off the internet. Uh, there are exceptions, right? Some stuff is explicitly open license. Most of you will have heard about Creative Commons licenses. Some materials are in the public domain. In the US, that's everything the government uh, publishes. That's not, by the way, uh, an international rule. That's just US uh, law. So uh, British government publications, Canadian government publications uh, fall under copyright. Um, if you uh, use physical archives, they often have explicit rules about publishing digital copies of their holdings. They differ a lot. US archives tend to be fairly permissive. European archives less so, in particular German archives I know are very strict about uh, their rules regarding this. Ask them, don't burn any bridges by putting, putting stuff on a repository and uh, then have them find you. Um, if you use digital archives, especially commercial ones like ProQuest or Gale historical documents, even when the material they present is technically out of copyright, right? Like 19th century newspaper articles say, um, the license terms that you agree to by using something like that are incredibly strict and typically make it uh, <clears throat> entirely impossible to share those materials. Um, one concern that we also hear a lot is, you know, aren't we just imitating uh, quantitative researchers? Is this whole data sharing reproducibility? Isn't this just, I've heard the term positivist straight jacket, uh, those sorts of things. Uh, this I just found on Twitter two days ago, and I uh, thought I'd share it with you. Laura is uh, just grounded theory, uh, kind of sociology work. And, and she makes the point that, that allowing broader access and transparency to her work is really not a question about positivism, it's a question of democratizing knowledge. I, she's, she's quite radical in her views. Uh, I don't need anyone, everyone to, to be quite as all in with their, with their uh, transparent dedication to transparency. But um, I think it's a nice way to think about this, that you may have different reasons to be uh, transparent. This may not just be, you know, because you're following the quote unquote scientific methods, but this may just be because um, allowing deeper engagement and inquiry into your materials and methods um, is more democratic, is more uh, discursive, is however you like to think about uh, the role of your research into in scientific um, communication. Um, so we've talked about the institutional membership. Uh, I would say there are three parts that I want to highlight. Uh, we do free curation and storage that includes, you know, the consultations uh, for what I like to call typical qualitative data projects. So that's uh, typically what's in an article, what comes out of a dissertation. If you have a giant multi-person grant funded research project, uh, right, you want to deposit uh, 50 gigabytes of videos and uh, 200 uh, transcripts that we have to review, uh, please talk to us and write us into your grant. It's still not going to be a huge, uh, you know, red line in your grant budget, but we can't do that off the, uh, off the costs that we feel are reasonable to charge for, for institutional membership. Um, we are very happy to do uh, data management and data management planning consultation that can be just with QDR, that could also be uh, as a, as a three-way conversation with Linda or Florio, uh, who know the institutional uh, Avail, um, structures at Cornell better and can point you to, you know, maybe use these computing resources, these storage resources, those sorts of things. Um, <clears throat> that can be for data management plans. So I routine, routinely review uh, the two pages that people send for the NSF before they send them, mostly when QDR is written into them, but that's not a strict requirement. Um, I also, if you do teach uh, typically graduate level classes, but if you really want your undergrads to hear about this, I'm game for that too. Uh, as my time permits, I'm very happy, 
uh, to, to Zoom into classes. And those are often really good conversations. And in my experience as younger scholars are kind of at a good place where they kind of shape their views on that and are perhaps less jaded by existing disciplinary discourses, either all for or all against. And so that's a really fun opportunity uh, to, to talk and think through these issues. Um, I do want to make my general spiel of why can't you just put this on your website? Why should you put this in a data repository, whether it's QDR or otherwise? Uh, one of the co core parts is it's going to stay there and the link to it, those are the, the DOIs. Those are going to stay the same for hopefully as long as any of us will live. Um, that also applies to the long-term preservation, right? When we think through file formats, we think through which file formats will be around in 30 and 50 years. And if we were wrong, kind of we monitor the ones that we have and we are able to continue transforming them as need be, say if for some reason PDF ever goes away. Um, we can help you improving the quality of the data you share, what you share, what you document, how you share. Uh, we put a lot of emphasis on making our data discoverable. So you can find it obviously at QDR. Our data is also all indexed by the Google data search. It's available on uh, the uh, data site, the organization who gives us DOIs for data search. It's available on the Harvard Dataverse. Uh, they harvest for, uh, our metadata. So it's findable in a lot of different uh, ways. And uh, we, we think that's very important because one of the reasons surely you share the data is so that others can find it and use it and give you credit um, for it. And then finally, uh, we are able to um, handle access controls. While it's possible for you to be involved in the process of uh, providing access to data based on requests, in most cases, uh, researchers are happy to just kind of delineate, these are the criteria that I want, and then uh, we handle the actual uh, formalities and you get a couple less emails, which I'm sure you all appreciate. Um, and then, as I said, um, sharing these uh, later, two things that um, obviously there's our website. One thing uh, that we're quite proud of, we've uh, done with funding from SSRC, an online course on managing qualitative research data that really goes from uh, how do you think about the planning process, how do you organize, and then how do you work with the uh, collected uh, data that's all uh, open licensed, open source, et cetera, et cetera, and that's available there. Uh, and then if you are thinking about applying for a grant, I know all the January, February grant deadlines are coming in. NSF is increasingly pushing uh, for people to use the DMP tool for writing uh, data management plans. And I can make a little pre-announcement here. That's not quite official yet, but we've joined with DMP tool and the Princeton University's uh, research data services for uh, and we'll have a, a small competition for the best data management plan for qualitative research uh, that's uh, going to happen uh, spring uh, 2021. So your this round and last round data management plans uh, would be eligible. And uh, yeah, with that, looking forward to questions. Thank you very much, Sebastian. That was really fantastic. Um, Linda, both um, really, really helpful in terms of thinking about um, the, the kinds of institutional support that's available to us at Cornell, which um, I personally have really, uh, I learned a lot. <laughs> so um, I, I guess um, I will say that if people have questions, you can put them into chat, you can raise your hands. Um, I might start out maybe um, if you will allow me. I'm um, really interested in just, well, I have, a, I have many questions, uh, Sebastian, but one is um, this question, I think in quantitative research and open science, reproducibility is a big goal of open science. And yet I think within qualitative work, that is less of a goal, I think. And so I guess I'm just wondering how, like, have you seen people do replications or is it really about engaging with the research, the data in a different kind of way? Or what, how have you seen that sort of play out? Yeah, uh, that's a, I actually was considering putting a slide on it and, and then I decided against it and I should have, um, but, uh, so I'm mostly a reproducibility skeptic uh, for qualitative research. Um, 
And the reason is that I think uh, they're very, uh, I think two main reasons. One reason is that I think a lot of us come from a somewhat interpretive uh, perspective, right? And that's a wide spectrum from like, you know, post-structuralist interpretation to quasi-positivist interpretation, if you want. But I think all interpretation means that the person of the researcher is involved in the act of getting from data to uh, results. And at that point, it becomes not reproducible. Um, that's reason number one. I think even if you are more positivist oriented, a lot of qualitative research happens at an earlier stage of the research cycle. So more oriented to its hypothesis, generation, measurement, uh, those sorts of things, and again, much harder to reproduce. All that said, we are running a project on what we call verification of uh, qualitative research uh, that we've done some articles for the American Journal of Political Science. Those of you who know political science may know that AJPS has a policy that all quantitative research gets verified, uh, which means that all the code must run and produce exactly the tables and figures as they get published. And so we are running the qualitative equivalent, which is essentially um, going uh, through the qualitative, typically case studies for AJPS and looking at the empirical claims they make and checking that the sources they use, whether they're secondary or primary, actually back up what they say. So it's close to a sort of, of, of fact checking. Uh, and it's fairly limited, I would say. It, um, there is, you know, one could argue how we, it's, it's a really interesting question of how deep we go, but it's the closest to reproducibility uh, that I know. And I think it works for AJPS because by its disciplinary role, and I'm sorry, I don't uh, know if many people are familiar with poli-sci disciplinary roles, but uh, it's a very, very positivist journal. So it's 95% uh, quantitative and the people who publish there qualitatively uh, do so still within kind of a similarly um, kind of causal inference, uh, generalized uh, rules type of, um, organized framework. I don't think we could do the same type of work reasonably for the heavily ethnographic or interpretive article, but we do have an NSF grant proposal in to figure out how more of that would look, so. Great, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think personally, I, I always question why we've come to this point. Like, what is it that we don't trust either each other or something that we we need this kind of um, checks and balances, I think, but um, yeah. yeah. So, so if I may, because I don't think of them as text, checks and balances. So when I have looked at reproducibility materials of quantitative articles, it's rarely been because I didn't believe the researchers, although some skepticism is perhaps um, warranted, but really because I was interested in engaging more deeply. And so the first article I ever wrote uh, was grabbing a couple of uh, people's uh, reproducibility material, and uh, I didn't quite buy a measurement that they have used, had used. So we recoded the variables, one of their key variables, and rerun the same material, which we could because we had all the data of code of the original analysis. So I think as the function really as transparency, and the transparency is what really allows us to more deeply engage with the research that's that's happening. When Gary King uh, published uh, a seminal article in the mid 90s uh, that he called unfortunately replication replication, but he means reproducibility in that context. Um, he, his justification for this is not to check that people aren't cheating, but his justification is that by providing all the materials that allow other people to reproduce our research, I'm providing actually all the materials that allow them to understand what we've actually done in our analysis. So that level of transparency, that's what I kind of target for qualitative research too, not as I said, I don't believe reproducibility is a goal or necessary, but I think that transparency allows people to more deeply engage with our work. And that's why, why I think we should do it. That's great, thank you. Um, I see that Nick Klein has a question. 
Uh, thanks, Lee. And thanks so much for the for this talk. It was a really interesting presentation. Um, I had a, a related question to Lee's. Um, one thing I didn't see in the presentation, and I, I'm assuming it's there, but is the capability to share sort of the coded data from QDA software, right? And, and, and I'm curious if people do that often and sort of how that works with the various softwares that people have, and then sort of how you think about that if you were going to do that at the beginning of a research project rather than at the end where you're like, oh, now how do I package this out? <laughs> Well, these are great questions. I, I, I'm, so, I'm so happy with your questions. So QDAS project uh, used to be a huge mess because everyone has their own proprietary data format and you can't share it. Uh, there is now, and some of you may have actually stumbled across this, there is a joint format that uh, is uh, most typically referred to as uh, REFI QDA, R-E-F-I for a Rotterdam Exchange Format Initiative uh, QDA. Uh, Atlas, Deduce, uh, MaxQDA, and InVivo all uh, export into that format. Uh, since they all vary somewhat by capabilities, uh, there's some data loss involved, but your basic, you know, uh, texts and codings uh, are now able to travel between uh, between software, which is cool for whole hosters reason. I hope it will also be cool for teaching and those sorts of things. Uh, it's also great for us as an archive because it's an open format and we don't have to say, well, we can store your, you know, in vivo project file, but we have no idea if you'll be open, uh, able to open it in five years. Uh, so we love that. We're super excited about it. Uh, we, again, have a grant project in to study more about how, how we can better uh, take advantage of that. People don't uh, share coded data a ton. We have, I think, two projects in QDR where that's the case. We'd love to get more. I think it's a really rich opportunity to kind of in that vein, show more um, of your work. Um, we, I honestly don't, I have some theoretical ideas about how to work in a way that uh, makes sharing easier. And I guess the biggest one is to kind of keep uh, keep notes about which memos uh, you would want to remove before sharing those sorts of things. Um, but I don't have a lot of empirical uh, kind of experiences to uh, to um, uh, to to back that up. And we'd love to study that more. And that's part of uh, the, a grant that we've in with the Institute for Museum and Library Sciences. And then Linda posted more information. Mm -hmm. Uh, thanks so, so much. Yeah. Uh, uh, sorry, sorry, Linda, you go, please. Yeah. Um, I'm just saying the, the thing I posted, it's a gear to librarians who are curating data, qualitative data in Atlas TI format. Um, but it, it does provide some, uh, I think, interesting questions that you can ask yourself as you're creating your data mm -hmm. set that might be helpful for thinking of how the librarian or the archivist who would be thinking about your data set. So it's kind of uh, working that, backward that way. Yeah. And it looks like that has the info about the format that Sebastian was talking about. Great, thanks so much, that was great. Any other questions? I was like, maybe I'll ask then um, while you all think, because I'm, so I, I Sebastian, um, do, I know you said it works best when someone is starting out. Um, but I also know we have a, a year to get projects up. And so, I mean, like a, a number of projects up here at Cornell. And so I'm wondering um, what are the circumstances under which you would work with someone who has a, a project which has already been collected, already been analyzed, maybe already published. Um, and they're thinking about this as a kind of archive transparency kind of um, opportunity? Uh, I mean, uh, any circumstances. We, tr we try to do our best with, uh, with uh, any, any data that comes our way, really. Uh, the one exception is human participant data where the consent excludes data sharing. We can still think about, are you able to share um, what we've done is, you know, extensive documentation. If you've done coding of the data, maybe a, a well-documented coding map matrix with excerpts, which would typically be considered more like a publication, so so wouldn't be prevented by that consent. But um, but so that would be the scenario where we'd actually, you know, give you 
a hard ish no but otherwise uh, we'll try our best and so one of the one of the things that we published um, earlier this year was uh, Mark Trachtenberg's papers for 2000 some uh, mid 2000s uh, book and materials he had collected over three or four decades uh, prior to that um, and uh, that was a lot of work. Uh, it's also enormous amount of materials. I think a total of two and a half thousand or so documents and not particularly well organized. Um, but uh, it ended up published and it's a, it's a great project. So essentially we'll try to work with that, uh, with, with whatever you had, just because it's not in a perfect state doesn't mean you can't share it. It's also possible to, you know, share perhaps an excerpt if you feel like you maybe don't have the capacity to de-identify every single one of your transcripts, uh, but you feel like if you are able to show maybe 10 or 20 percent of your transcripts, and we have a couple of projects that did that, uh, that would allow people to get a much deeper read into your data, even though it's not the completeness of the data, and then that gets covered in the documentation. That's helpful, thank you. Um, so I'm not seeing any other questions. So I, maybe I'll end with one last question, which is um, next steps. So if someone is interested, um, is the first step to reach out to you, Linda, or is it to reach out to Sebastian or both of you? What do you, what do you recommend? Uh, whatever's easiest, <laughs> but there, we, I mean, we would like to have a sense of how many people are going to Cornell, but we can, or, or to um, QDR, but we can always communicate with Sebastian. So if somebody ends up at QDR without going through us, we, we they'll let us know. Um, going forward this year, there's unlimited seats. Next year, it will be five, top possibly. So at that point, we will have to keep a little better track of who's coming through. And at, at that point, there'll be more communication. So me, if you would like, <laughs> or Sebastian. Or like. both of us at once, right? You can yeah, just CC both fun. of us on an email and then. Uh, Linda will be in the loop and it's probably then we'd schedule the uh, conversation yeah. with you. And that way, if there are other things that people are wanting to know about, like need software support or team support, then we can do, step in there. That's great. And, th and so the, the, the timing is upon signing up for it, not when the data gets deposited, right? In terms of timing of those. Perfect. I'm just thinking of all of the, um, the those graduate students who are working on dissertations who are, you know, beginning at the stages and, you know, it might be, um, they might not even be around Ithaca or at Cornell by the time they're actually ready to deposit everything. So um, mm -hmm. we want to make sure we can support them. Excellent. Great. Well, thank you, Sebastian, Linda, thank you. This was incredibly informative. I feel like I can go forth um, and at least tell people to contact you. <laughs> I can't answer all the questions. I wanna thank everyone for coming um, and joining us today. Um, I hope you found this as, as helpful as I did. We um, are recording it and Sebastian said and, uh, that he would be willing to share his slides. And um, we will definitely be sure to get Linda back to help <laughs> share with us uh, some of the software stuff. Um, which I know we're all uh, trying to manage. So thank you again and have a wonderful weekend, everyone. Take care. Have a great Bye. weekend, everyone. Thank Bye. Thanks again, Bye. Sebastian. Bye. Thanks. Thanks, Linda. Thank you. Thanks for having me. All right, shall we stop recording?